here. Uh, the closing plenary um, at this meeting is given over to the Paul Evan Peters Award and Memorial Lecture. And let me tell you just a little bit about Paul Peters. There's a blue um, uh, brochure which was in your um, packets and you'll also find this information on the web. Um, I know some of you knew Paul. Um, I knew Paul, he was a good friend. Um, he was the founding, um, uh, the founding director and um, you know, sort of dynamo that uh, built the coalition. Um, he served as director from 1990 to 1996 uh, at, at the time of his um, sudden and uh, untimely death. He made um, great contributions. He was an extraordinary person. And we did several things um, in his memory. Um, one was to establish a um, fellowship uh, for a um, graduate student in a library information science program, and we um, award that every, uh, every uh, year or two. The other was the Paul Evan Peters Award. And this was set up by the Association of Research Libraries, Educause, and CNI. Um, we were grateful to have some funding from Microsoft Corporation and Xerox Corporation to set up a, um, a fund to uh, um, endow the award. We give it out every couple of years, and the bar on this award is very high. Um, it really speaks to sustained um, leadership and vision in creating major change in society through information science, uh, the intelligent use of technology, networked information, recognizing opportunities where um, technology can change the way we create, share, relate to, discover information. Um, and you can find a um, list of previous award winners um, in um, the back of the, uh, the blue brochure. The, we, we set up a committee every year, uh, or every cycle, because we do this award every couple of years. And I'd like to recognize the committee members that are here. Um, this is doing, serving on this committee is quite a bit of work. It's one of these, um, I think, pieces of work that's wonderful to do um, in a certain sense. Um, but it is still a important commitment of time for our community and we're grateful for their service. Um, we have with us from the committee um, George Strawn, who is the um, director of NIDRD, and I'll say a word or two more about NIDRD later. Um, thank you, George. We have with us Sally Jackson, um, a professor of communication at Illinois Champaign-Urbana, um, somewhere over there, I believe. Uh, I've got a lot of light in my eyes here. Um, and I, of course, uh, Joan Lippincott, who uh, serves ex officio on the uh, committee um, from CNI, who is, I think, somewhere in the back there, yes. Um, we had a fourth member as well, and I dearly wish I could recognize her, um, the uh, late and uh, much missed um, Ann Wolpert, uh, the uh, head of libraries at MIT, also served on this committee. And, um, I think that was an that was an incredible group that um, selected a incredible person. The award winner is Dr. Donald Lindbergh, and um, let me tell you just a little bit about him and his contributions. Um, there is a longer and probably slightly more factual version of everything in the brochure. Um, but um, I just want to say a few things. One, it's wonderful that 
we're giving him the award in St. Louis because he actually has ties to this part of the world early in his career. Um, he spent time as a faculty member at the uh, University of Missouri um, uh, quite a number of years ago now. Um, but uh, it's, it's wonderful um, to close that circle. Since 1984, he has been the director of the National Library of Medicine for the United States. Over the period of time from 1984 to the present, um, the you know, list of achievements, the number of times the National Library of Medicine looked at the future and said, what does that mean for our strategic plan and got it right again and again, very much to the service of our nation, the world, the um, life and health sciences um, is just, uh, it's really striking to me and I can't think of any institution that has um, really uh, gotten that kind of a series of consistent um, strategic uh, decisions, right? You know, there are organizations that build, you know, 30 years on getting one of these right, getting them right again and again and again and seeing the future um, and then making that future happen is um, just an amazing credit to Don's leadership. Uh, think about what's happened since 1984 the National Center for Biotechnology Information, uh, which really positioned us and supported uh, through its informatics programs, um, the whole molecular biology and genomics revolution that's uh, occurred since, PubMed, the whole notion of connecting health information um, to the populace at large um, and uh, changing that whole relationship, um, uh, incredible. The, the Visual Human Project, um, uh, what an amazing demonstration of what information technology and networked information could do. Um, I could go on and on, um, the, the work they did with clinical trials and making the availability and the outcomes of clinical trials available to the um, both physicians and the public. Um, again, amazing stuff. Um, I do want to just remind you of one uh, little detail. Um, while all of this wonderful stuff was going on, um, Back in the 1990s, um, Don took on an extra assignment in his um, free time, um, which he had so much of, of course, at NLM, uh, founding what was called then the Coordinating Office, which really was put together to pull all of the pieces of high performance and computing and communication investment that were going on throughout the federal government and try and mold them into a much more coherent program. Um, that work continues today. Um, it's now called NIDR D, and indeed George um, sits in a position that is a direct, I believe, kind of lineal descendant of the work that um, Don started there. Um, so um, in parallel with all of the tremendous things that he's done for us at the National Library of Medicine, um, he also played a major role in um, building that coherent high performance computing and communications program that has served us well um, through the last uh, 15 years or so. A great record of achievement and um, exactly the kind of sustained accomplishment in um, uh, changing the world that we hope to recognize with the Paul Evan Peters Award. Um, before turning the podium over to, um, to Don for the memorial lecture, 
Um, I'd just like to do two last things. First, I'd like to note we have a lovely bowl commemorating the event that we're both afraid to touch um, because it's glass and it's heavy and it will sit there until we put it back in its cage and ship it. Um, but if you'd you know, like to admire it later, um, please do. And I'd also like to just take a second to um, recognize uh, Mary Lindbergh, who's also here in the audience with uh, Don. Um, it was wonderful that you could join us. Thank you. With that, <laughs> congratulations, Don. Um, and I'll just say, you know, Paul is somewhere smiling. Over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, also for the kind invitation. Thanks to CNI for sponsoring this award. Uh, Paul Peters really was special. He was brilliant, he was charming, he was visionary. And Mary and I had sort of settled down to a string of nice dinners with him and his wife in Washington when his life came to an untimely end. So I, I'm, I'm doubly touched to be here and I thank you once again. So if any of you are reaching around for a, 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 a pen and pencil to write down uh, all the things you'll learn, I, I would say just put them away. <laughs> Not likely to learn anything worth writing down. What I'm going to offer you is, is kind of the backstage at the Metropolitan Opera. So this is a, a somewhat personal view of some of these events that uh, were referred to. Let me jump into the middle of all this. After World War II, as all librarians and such people will remember, the research reports really exceeded in number what could be handled by the old manual library systems. And at NLM, they invented a thing called GRACE, Graphic Arts Com Compositing Equipment. I'll show you a picture of it. And that was really the beginning of Medlars, Medline, Regional Medical Libraries, that whole development. This is what it looked like. Uh, it lives in the Smithsonian, and I persuaded them to give it back to us on the occasion of our 100th anniversary, 150th anniversary in 86. I didn't realize it was quite as big and heavy as it is, so it got as far as the loading dock. Um, I didn't take this picture, someone took it before, but I, I got the panels off the damn thing so I could see what's inside it. And its purpose was to uh, permit the printing of index medicus, basically, to take the image of a page and output it to a negative, photographic negative that could be used to print those, uh, pa those wonderful pages. So at the same time, of course, there was a Missouri, and there was Mary and me, and that where we were. But uh, where was I? Well, I was sitting in a TD4, I think it was called, one of those Quonset hut type things. Uh, which was nominally a laboratory, but we finally got a better lab. Anyway, I was reading this report uh, produced by General Electric, commissioned by National Library of Medicine, and I had heard about it, and I wrote and got it and read it. And essentially, it was asking, NLM was asking, would it be possible for a computer to take, let's say, the citation and the, even the, I think just maybe the, abs the citations of all the articles in, say, 100 of good medical journals and put them in a computer and sort of do something with them. And that was the first part, and the second part was the back, of course, you know, progress is our most important product that we remember for children. And uh, they did say yes, it was possible, and I, I understood better now than then why an agency like NLM would ask somebody like GE to sort of validate their intuition but I now understand that that was actually a pretty smart thing to do. And GE was smart in validating their intuition. They ended up recommending three-quarter Honeywell computers and three-quarter inch tape, which I knew even at the time was a bad idea. <laughs> but at Missouri, even in those days, we were trying to use computers to serve physicians, ultimately, of course, beyond physicians. So I was putzing around with uh, University of Missouri lab reporting system, which used IBM card readers and paper tape, and I mean, it was a codge. But on the other hand, it drove teletype machines up on the ward, so it printed the reports. We, on the other hand, summarized those in the, in the, paper, in the uh, 
punch cards. And the, the university kindly gave me from midnight until 12.15 to summarize those records. I learned how to run both tape readers and card readers. This was, initially it was an IBM 1410, and uh, that was our console and a good operator, John Weiniger. Uh, we did actually, Mary and I used to go up to Aspen most summers, and here we gave a course in medical informatics, you know, computers and medicine, I guess we would have called it. And so one of the people there, Lloyd Morris, that was later head of a foundation which sponsors Sesame Street, Sam Garten was a postdoc with me, and we were giving demonstrations on uh, acoustically coupled 110 board teletype machines, which you see. Some of you might even remember them. They worked. And what we were really teaching was medical decision making. And one of the bases for that, of course, is the Bayes model of prior probabilities, which was published only in 1959 in Science by uh, Lee Lustad and uh, Bob Ledley. Most, and they stayed around for a good many years. I knew both of them very well. But within a year, by 1960, another colleague at Missouri, Gwilym Lodwig, the radiologist, had already implemented that decision-making prior probability thing in the reporting of clinical radiographs. Very good guy. We stayed friends most of our lives. The machine was an IBM 1410. I'll just show you this uh, core memory because so many people now don't have the slightest idea in the world that cores actually refer to magnetic cores. It isn't the concept, it's a device. As I remember, I think it was invented by Far J. Forrester. So there are the cores and their connections, and in contrast, you know, a somewhat more modern disk with not eight bytes of memory, but eight gigabytes of memory, just to remind us. In a way, not, not how far we've come, but how simple the machines were that we're trying to do anything with. Anyway, I loved uh, Columbia, Missouri, and University of Missouri, and all the people there. But I nonetheless uh, marched off to NLM in 1984. And we started immediately to advance that same proposition of serving the medical profession and ultimately patients by utilizing these strange things called uh, microprocessors, or laptops ultimately, and personal computers, if you can imagine such a thing. And uh, if you didn't have a personal computer, but you're a practitioner, uh, we had a system called Lonesome Doc, uh, the Marlboro Man, and you could, you could order this thing by telephone talking to a medical librarian, and then you could stop by the library to get the reprints, you know, because you didn't have a, an online machine. Uh, I found in 1984, to my amazement, that my predecessors had made all wise decisions, but uh, they didn't have any long-range plan. And they, I admitted of happily that it had got, institution had gotten along pretty well for 148 years without me but I felt I needed a plan, and we started one, and it's probably the best thing I did for the institution. And it went through different parts and pieces. In this case, we showed the first five, and there was a bit of discussion about what should those five things can, can, uh, aim themselves at, I guess you'd say, have, has a, the subject. But there never was any, d about, any doubt in my mind that they should be bottom-up plans. In other words, they should be written and composed by the people we're, we're claiming to serve, not top-down, not the boss saying, here's what we're going to do, because those are known to just end up in the trash basket. We didn't try to do everything the first time, so we left space for things that we knew would be necessary but a little more narrow, like the electronic imaging, uh, the global stuff for overseas work, and, the, you'll see, uh, I guess I can't, I don't know, can I point? Yeah, I can point. So here's Michael DeBakey. He headed our outreach plan. Uh, we finally ran out of plans, actually, in 2006. I was 20-year plan, so we did another 10-year. Sim similar idea. The nature of both plans uh, really s start out by saying, this is not how you go, this is not a day-to-day -day operational plan. This is a goal. This, this describes the port you're going to get to if, or if the sailing goes well. So it's a, it's a map of where you could be if all goes well. 
But it's dependent upon funding, it's dependent upon lots of people wanting to work with you, it's, like, it's dependent upon the people you're trying to help wanting the help. So that's my idea of long-range planning. I'll give you just a few examples. I mean, I'd love to, actually I'd love to spend the whole rest of the day telling you about NLM, because I think it's great, but you don't want that, and if you are interested, you can find it out quickly on the home pages. But here's an example. Uh, we were actually hankering after the high-performance communications and publications and imaging and stuff like that that the big boys could do. So we were, we were looking at uh, uh, how, how to, uh, when the computer finally got big enough and smart enough to do something about imaging, not just text. And the opportunity came when we figured out that uh, we could barely manage to do some anatomy, which is of course at the heart of medicine, certainly. And so we got a recommendation from the board to go ahead and try to do a digital imagining of an adult male and female actual cadaver. Other people had tried to do digital this and that, but basically, you know, to, to have a digital little finger done in California and a digital right ear done in Massachusetts, it just doesn't add up to spell mother. So, you know, we, we gathered together the people who are experts in digital anatomy, such as it was, and they said, man, do it. I mean, that is the right role for an agency. Just do the whole damn thing, give us the database. So, we got lots of help, but in the end, we got, you know, a smashingly good product. Uh, at the time, there was much talk about, well, if you ever did all this and you got all these things, it would be this huge number of gigabytes, whatever they are, and how would you store them and what would happen? Uh, so two things happened once. The wonderful guy named Dan Macy, so I had hired to run List Hill, said, I'll tell you what, if we have to do it, we'll put it all in 55 CD-ROMs. <laughs> you can imagine how handy that would be. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, a good engineer who had gotten onto the Board of Regents, Alvy Ray Smith, possibly the top computer graphics guy in the world, Pixar and all that, he said, he, he could sort of step forward and say, look, uh, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, let, let the guys do this, but they should do their part, and I guarantee you the engineers of the world will stay out way ahead of them. We'll, we'll have the storage devices by the time they get done, don't worry. It's a tremendously big help. So we did the first one at one millimeter thickness, and the female at a third of a millimeter. There's lots of sort of tales about all that, but I was frankly a little worried. I was trying to get the damn thing shifted over to be done in Sweden, to be truthful, because I didn't want the, the organization accused of, you know, Hitlerian and inhumane and so forth behavior. But anyway, we slipped under the wire, got it done, at least the mail, and it was announced that Radiological Society of North America, the biggest medical professional meeting in the country, even now, but it was in, in uh, Chicago. And uh, I was very pleased. I mean, they do it very technically able. Um, and I got back to Columbia. I got back home, I guess in that case it was in Washington. And Mary said, well, there's a phone call from you, for you from the whatever newspapers in London. And uh, they jumped on the case about, is it true you were doing these barbaric things and making slicing up bodies and putting them in computers and so forth? I said, yeah, we did, just announced it. And uh, it, the, the mail was from Texas, provided by the Anatomical Board of Texas, and they had already caved in. They'd already given this blasted reporter the name of the individual, which they promised never to do. And, so she called, and they, so they, she buzzed around and, and called the mother and described this terrible thing. I, I didn't say it, but the guy was the double murderer, and he had willed his body to us. And uh, so they ranted on her, and she said, listen, young lady, that is the only decent thing that boy has ever done. <laughs> <laughs> So I was in the clear. <laughs> we later figured out how to do one third of a millimeter in the case of the, the female, and there's a good story there too, with fully informed consent, I can assure you. 
But there are over 3,000 licenses in 64 countries. We don't sell it, but we do require a license. And it's gone all over the world. So the Da Vinci machines that, with which you can do surgery and brains and so forth uh, very much rely on, on this kind of imagery. And the, the Voxelmann is a place of, of a data set that particularly artistically well done from Hamburg. Uh, but we, we got done with this first one, and I, I assume that, I'll go back, just keep your mind there. I assume that having done this pretty nice thing, I mean, this is the best piece of anatomy since Versalius, I kid you not. I assume that the good old American industry would jump in and sell software to do stuff with it, and they didn't. They didn't do a darn thing. So we said, okay, well, we'll do the software too then and did it, and it was well used. And uh, five years passed, and it turned out how, you know, how fast things change in technology. Now you have video cards, which do in hardware what we were doing in software. So of course it's better to do the hardware version. So we started a whole new project uh, to, to, pr to redo the software using the hardware devices. And, uh, uh, that was successful too. I don't know how much time to spend in telling you about it, but in both cases we invoked a model that I was wanted, where you have university people and corporate people working together on a joint project, carefully coupled. And uh, they did that, and it actually invented a whole new mechanism called uh, extreme programming, which essentially means that, well, to give you an example, the company, one of the companies is General Electric, a pretty big one, Another one was a small one, uh, kitware, and they all operated on the same rules. Namely, you know, there's a, there's a control panel up on the top, and uh, your pro, your subroutine or whatever you're given, and it has to work on on uh, Macs and Wintels and Unix. So your latest contribution has to run compatibly with all the others. You got to get green lights, or at the end of the month you don't get paid. So people said to me, Lindbergh, you guys are nuts. You can't treat people like GE that way. I said, well, we'll see. <laughs> but it turned out that the greatest fans of that technique was General Electric. They said, this is absolutely wonderful. You don't mind, we're going to copy you with our contractors. <laughs> so the whole thing did get done, and uh, usefully. Uh, so what does it do? Well, it really does the segmentation. It lines up all of those cross sections so that you can operate at any view you want. That's the whole point of it all. And it's open source. Uh, and it has, it does this. It lets you look at those cross sections and then segment out individual parts. So you can, you can have this fellow dancing a jig if you want to, people have. The IT community now is like this, large number of downloads in the last 12 months, 160 a day, there are thousands of registered users, and, uh, and active contributors, so the developers are a substantial number, and it's, it's just the big, uh, largest open source teams in the world. I mean, it's been a very, very pleasant operation, and the, the ultimate code is used by lots of things cited here, but that includes both GE and Siemens. So anyone in the, in the and the team can use it for any purpose they want. I mean, it's a very satisfactory thing. Now next is the NCBI part. Uh, we we uh, use the term fa uh, factual information from databases because at the time that I came there, uh, we had, of course, Medline files, which are bibliographical medical library type files. But we also had toxicology things, and they're really very different. I mean, the toxicology would be, you know, 30,000 characters in a row and so forth. And so I thought, well, uh, what would a smart computer scientist do with that dilemma? And already know from University of Missouri experience, he would notch it up a level. He'd go a level above what you're talking about, which was a, a factual database. But in the case of biotechnology, it, it, be, it turned out early in the long-range planning that uh, people were kind of focused on nucleotides and the sequence, those are the parts of DNA and the position of the so-called genes. And uh, we didn't understand it too well, but uh, we asked a guy named Alan Newell, um, no, Alan, uh, Alan Maxim, 
who was a biochemist from Stanford and was on our advisory committee, what was all this stuff about? And he said, so I guess you want uh, biotechnology 101 for med students. I said, yeah, I guess so. You know, take the podium for the next 20 minutes and tell us, you know, get chalk on your sleeves and we'll enjoy it. And he explained the whole thing. This is the cell, these are the chromosomes, this is them, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it, everybody sort of looked around and said, man, that's a library problem. I mean, people are developing their own list of these things and they don't share them and all the value is in putting it together. That's a library problem. So we, we put together a uh, essentially a piece of legislation which we claimed was, you know, inspired by the deity, of course. <laughs> you can see the spark moving. <laughs> uh, and there was a path, really. Uh, I think if there was a, a, a real inspiring idea, it was probably Renato Del Bucco, who uh, essentially said, uh, this is the time we've got to, I'm sorry, he, he essentially said, this is, this is the time to make the big advance on cancer and publish the paper in science, but we were actually a little bit ahead of him. In any case, you've got to go through appropriation, authorization, various kinds of wrangling. But our board once again said, okay, do it. Do, do a National Center for Biotechnology Information as soon as possible, intramural and extramural. It was Del Becco. The turning point in cancer research, that was his view. Ours was much more broad more at genetics level than at the cancer level, but they ran together. Now, the person who actually introduced the legislation is in the center, Senator Paul, uh, Claude Pepper, absolutely another wonderful guy. He's being uh, operated on by the Sister Act. So the lady on his right is, uh, Claude uh, is uh, the sister of the then vice president and the lady on the other side is Alice Fordyce, who's the sister of uh, Mary Lasker. So uh, Francis Humphrey Howard worked for me. Basically, everybody worked for, for Lasker. But he got, his ear, he got an earful, and uh, we helped in the legislation. This was a, a party, of course. That's the way Washington operates. Young man in the middle, David Lippmann, brilliant guy we'd recruited to, to run this National Center for Biotechnology Information, Mr. Pepper. Uh, and next to me is uh, Jack Whitehead, who is the owner of uh, Technicon Corporation, and Senator Pepper, and on the right, Jim Weingarten, who is head of uh, NIH. So we did ultimately have a hearing on this, March 6, 87, Pepper hearings in this Part of the, my reminiscence is about that. Also, I mean, it turned out that we did persuade Don Fredrickson, the former head of NIH, to testify, Victor McCusick, the great geneticist at Hopkins, Rich Roberts, who was on our planning committee. He, didn't, he hadn't yet gotten his Nobel Prize, but we all figured he would. And Jim Weingarten, who was then head of NIH, and myself. So this is just part of the general story that a lot of people got behind this. But it did remind me, in putting this together, that I was seriously worried that things weren't moving fast enough. Uh, you know, we had this recommendation to the board, we promised to do it, nothing happened, we didn't have a bill, we didn't have any hearings. And I went to see Senator Pepper, breaking all the rules in the book, of course, and uh, I told him how worried I was about the schedule and falling behind. He, he was a wonderful guy, he listened very Southern gentleman fashion. Uh, his pose was a simple country doctor, but, I mean lawyer, but he actually was law review at Harvard. He was a pretty sharp old man. And he said, doctor, don't worry. He said, I will introduce the bill in the House. Mr. Kennedy will introduce the bill in the Senate. And the bill will pass. <laughs> <laughs> And indeed it did, and it, was, it may have been a simpler life, but it was a better one. <laughs> so the resolution was by Kennedy and a number of others. Well, significantly including Domenici, who was sometimes called the, the senator from DOE. But it was good to get it all together. So we got lots of help from lots of people, and that's, you know, in the end, plenty of credit for anyone. And once the Dawn thing passed, of course, you have to have a cocktail party. 
And it was signed by the president and NCBI was authorized and created that very moment. And it got $8 million authorized by the Congress and ultimately appropriated as well. Uh, so then left, so now you're down to the nitty gritty. How do you actually do anything? I mean, all of us are limited, all administrators are limited by, uh, you know, money, space, and people. What else is there? Ideas are usually are pl plenteous. So we were being limited by FTEs at that time and uh, full-time equivalents, number of persons you could employ. And I persuaded an administrator of the, of the intramural research unit at NIH, kind of crushed the old fellow, but nice. And he said, I'm gonna, Don, I'm gonna give you 12 FTEs for this thing, and don't you use a single one of them for a damned administrator. <laughs> Which, of course, we both were, but anyway. So what was things really like in those days? I mean, you've heard about how many nucleotides, three billion and so forth, and everyone was worried about, can all this stuff go in a computer if it got in, could you ever get it out, and blah, blah. But it wasn't really, that really wasn't the way it was working. You didn't have stuff going into a machine and creaming out, you know, and getting transferred to another machine. And it was really different. Uh, Christian Burks was a guy at LANL. Has should be said that Walter Goad actually did the first uh, file of nucleotide sequences at Los Angeles National Laboratory, DOE. And he, uh, DOE was sort of like that, at least in those days. Some good ideas, actually we were paying for, we at NIH were paying for the work, but uh, Christian Burke said, you know, as soon as there was a public database, people expected data to be there, you know, of course, but it would take a year for anything to show up. So two years into the project, as far as Lionel was concerned, GenBank was 18 months behind. I mean, we were really getting worried and concerned, and the money actually came from and IGMS, National Institute of General Medical Sciences, NLM, and NSF. And you might think, oh, what a big burden it is, all these interagency things. Heck, that was like a 30-minute meeting once a year with no sweat at all. And uh, we'd sent money to Lionel, we'd sent money to Bolt Brannock, we sent money to Intelligenetics. And the last, court, the last thing was gonna end on October 1, 92, and in that third, about five minutes into that 30 minute meeting, we all said, fine, let it end. We're gonna transfer the whole damn thing back to NIH and David Lippmann will do it. And we took the money that would either, otherwise go to Lanel and put it in R01 grants at NIH. Now what did it look like to get data in those days? The exact reverse of what you would think, that this is all million bits per second stuff creaming in and out. I mean, not at all. I mean, these, they went through this stuff with a fine tooth comb. Nothing got in that they didn't really authenticate, we at NLM. So that's, that's a, a mock-up sheet. Now, why would that be? Uh, were people cheating? Not really. In fact, a very common complaint would be, now, here's the header that tells how many, you know, records and the length and so forth, and there's more records than you described. So, of course, many, many phone calls per day. So a phone call back to the contributor who says, well, yeah, that's right, I mean, we had some extra, so we thought we'd like that too. <laughs> of course, you know, metadata, be damned. So it took a while to, uh, you know, line all those things up and get it working smoothly, but if you want to end up with a, a system of, you know, 300 trillion whatevers, you got to take all of them carefully particularly the early ones. So Unified Medical Language System was another, I would say an achievement I'm really proud of. It's a thing that I knew we had to do, and I knew it would take 20 years, and I knew that no one would ever do it on a NIH R1. You know, it's just too big. So what we wanted to do is to overcome linguistic barriers so that data that was already machinable say a bibliographic, factual database, expert systems, whatever, you, you could understand that the machine could understand it, ultimately a person could understand it uh, in, in a medical way. So, so to take a simple-minded example, if you have the, the concept of this heart in your chest that beats along and sends blood to your brain and so forth, um, it, it really is the same concept, whether you call it the a Herz in German or a Kur in French or 
corazón and whatever Spanish language. That, that's not a problem. Natural language is not a problem. But what's a problem is to know that inside is an atrium and a ventricle and valves and stuff like that. So that's what we were building. And of course, there were pre-existing nomenclatures. And so we just shoveled them all in, actually using mesh as kind of an organizing principle. And we knew to begin with, Alexa McRae was the uh, linguist, and uh, Betsy Humphreys and I were the other types. But we, we figured there's only two kinds of ways that this can be organized. They're, you know, they're words or phrases, so they have a semantic type, like it would be a pharmacological substance or body part of disease, and all, the, all of the antibiotics are uh, s pharmacological substances. And then there would be relationships between those two. I mean, what else is there in language? So we, we actually had, we didn't, weren't two betting people. We had arguments and sort of paper bets going, would there be more semantic types or more relationships? And it wasn't intuitively obvious how it would turn out, but by, by the end of the first couple of years, we had 135 semantic types and 51 relationships. A relationship would be like treats. So a, a substance treats a disease. And we were off and running. Now that, by 1990, you see the numbers on the left, 64,000 concepts. Of course, we continued the work, and by 2013, there was 2,900,000 concepts, and of course, yet more terms, because there's more foreign languages. And the number of vocabularies that increased from you know, half a dozen to 168, again, because, in part because we internationalized it in 2007. We, we just plain internationalized it. And uh, I think it's, a, in the long run, a good thing, although there are inefficiencies to doing such things. But here, here you see, essentially, on the bottom, the concepts gradually increase. The different ways of saying it, of course, increase quite a lot. And this is the point at which you go non-English. So of course, if you throw in a bunch of foreign languages, you'll increase those terms. But that's a good thing. So the next uh, stop on my train ride was the, the White House. And uh, I had noticed that there was the Office of, Science, uh, Office of Science Technology Policy, President Science Advisor, they had had studies on the uh, environment. And uh, I, I objected to the fact that there were no medical or health people in it at all. I mean, I thought, why are you protecting the world to, for cauliflowers? Or aren't there some people that we got to have involved in this? and sort of groused about it, and lo and behold, some, the next thing that came along the line was high-performance computer. And uh, so we, you know, we got inserted as sort of the medical explants into some of those doings. And then one day, I got this phone call. You know, you're to report to the White House mess at noon. And I called my deputy, Smith. I said, Smith, what in the hell have you done? I'm getting called down to the GD White House. What's going on here? I figured we were really in the doghouse. But it turned out they wanted me to actually head this coordination office. And you know, the, the White House mess has a certain amount of magic to it. So I said yes. So the journey begins. Now, the High Performance Computing Act actually was passed in 91, bill introduced by Gore. Gore is very faithful to this, by the way, and was a bipartisan congressional uh, bill signed by President Bush in those days. And uh, the, so the uh, coordination office was established in September 92 when I was head of it. And I, I actually, we didn't put it into the, uh, the buildings downtown because the executive office building is, you know, it's grand, it's solid iron, cast iron, and in the entreaty rooms and all that, but it's not a good place to work. It's awkward. Uh, and the White House itself, I mean, people would die for an eight by 10 foot office. I mean, it's again, pretty, pretty non-functional for our kind of work. So Bernadine Healy was head of NIH and I asked her advice on the matter. And should I do it? And she said, oh yes, absolutely you should do it. She had been an OSTP earlier herself. And I said, what do you think about if I just do the whole damn thing at NLM? She said, oh, that's great, do it. Don't get caught down, downtown. So we started meeting, there were 12 agencies and there's a question, you know, the downtown is exciting and all that, but 
It turned out, actually, almost everybody lived in Montgomery County. So it worked fine. I just had a you know, mid-afternoon and everyone was on, you know, have a meeting, be on the way home. It worked beautifully. And we didn't have to put up with the stuffy security stuff in the White House. I bring to your attention, if there are any history buffs, I mean, there were history buffs. I've gone to your meetings the last couple of days. But if anyone is historically interested in the HPCC, there's a lovely gal named Sally Howe who worked with me in the first office, and then she's come back to work at NLM and gathering up the records and so forth and putting them into the History of Medicine Division. So if you have such things, please email Sally. We'd like to have them. So the program itself, what was it all about? Well, in public terms, it was to extend U.S. technology leadership, et cetera, apply and disseminate technologies to improve the national economy, provide key parts of the national information infrastructure. So an idea was emerging that there would be, you know, a coast-to-coast -coast information infrastructure of some sort. Oh, well, but by no, why was it not called a highway? Because uh, Gore's father had introduced the bill for the U.S. interstate many years before in the President Eisenhower time. So the idea of that as, as uh, infrastructure was pretty natural. So the management of it, so there's a coordination office, there are working groups or individual agencies, conferences, workshops, liaison stuff, uh, to, to the Congress, to federal organizations, state, academia, professional. So in other words, you've got to get out and tell the story. People don't read email, sorry to tell you, but they just don't. And if they read it, they don't do anything. So I mean, you've got to show up and tell the story, they won't even know you exist. Incidentally, the last line, mosaic and gopher servers, you, if you think back far enough, you'll, you'll say, ah, ha, ha, yeah. Well, mosaic was made at the uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana in a center that was funded by this office called the High Performance Computer Application Center. And of course, a, a clever graduate student, namely Mark Andresen, actually wrote mosaic, which included World Wide Web, strangest of all, but you know, we all understood gophers, and Waze was a different thing too, but it turned out that everybody loved a World Wide Web, and it took off, and so there we are. Uh, so people in, uh, Mark was a lot slimmer then, didn't have, had not so much hair, but he, he was slimmer, and he drank a lot of coffee. Um, he was a, did a brilliant job. So, uh, so with everyone having all these different objectives, what did it look like sort of back at headquarters, to the extent there was any headquarters? And it looked to us as if we've got to have some, something that we really know we're for and can measure and can explain. So our technical goals were really simple. Gigabit transmittivity, transmission speed, and petaflops computational speed. So two things you can measure. Fast computers, fast lines between them, and everybody smiling. So that was the, the strategy. So the first set of meetings, the whole thing was organized around what was called Grand Challenges, which has actually turned out to be a pretty darn good idea. And uh, those are some of them. But to take the industrial side, for example, well, how did they, were they sort of ordered about by this office? Well, ab absolutely not. The big companies that could see the need for supercomputing very easily, much earlier than we did, and they didn't need any persuading at all. So I'll give you an example of, uh, of a drawing of the, the Ford project, but uh, there's the crash of two Taurus automobiles. And uh, what's the effect upon the, the ones on the left where it's crumpling? Well, that is a computer job. It took, uh, you know, hours. In that case, it was executed at Oak Ridge. But Ford Company, the Ford Corporation themselves, had, they had a project which at one point was a secret project. And it was to automate the design and building of the right front end of a Taurus car. Now, that sounds simple-minded, but what they meant was we want to have that in, in computer space, not in paper drawings, and we want to know where all the parts came from, who were the suppliers, and what's the stockage of them. So that's a different thing, and that was a supercomputer piece of work. Now, along the same period of time, of course, 
Uh, wait a minute. I was going to tell you about other stuff. Uh, well, we, we had to go on with those other meetings I described. So we met with a whole bunch of federal computer center directors of different agencies and also non-federal computer center directors. We're looking for examples and ideas and advice and wanting them to know about what we're doing. So what advice did we actually get? I'll give you some examples. The National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, Bill Busby, swell guy, his advice was, we need computers that can sustain at least 100 gigaflops when executing compiled Fortran code with 64-bit precision. Now, there's a pretty understandable statement. I mean, if you like that kind of work. And his view is the architecture of the machines, we couldn't care less. You know, lots of good ones are, are shared memory machines, but we don't really care. Build whatever you want. But uh, don't forget that, that a variety is a, is, a, is a strength. Pittsburgh, Ralph Roski said, uh, and he's incidentally on my board today, Lack of third-party software for scalable parallel systems is a big obstacle. Caltech, Paul Messina, still a, good, still a leader in the field, he said, keep the emphasis on the high end. The PCs of tomorrow are the supercomputers of today. And man, was that ever true. I mean, it was, it's ridiculous to say it that way, but it's true, totally true. The ones you can hold in your hand are incredibly powerful machines. But they didn't get there without work. So he applauded a proposal from USC to us uh, for NSF to fund that to, to essentially redo the McNeil Schwendler NASTRAC software, which is fluid flow software, to make it parallel, to make it so it could drive parallel machines. That's what everybody wanted. And incidentally, some applications proved to be what they said embarrassingly parallel. You know, so for instance, the nucleotide analyses, they were parallel. It's very easy, you can parallelize them very simply. Other things are pretty tough. So the general problem of going simple to parallel is, is still not a solved problem at all. UCSD uh, pointed to software problems again, and more collaborative effort needed by software vendors, government, and centers to parallelize and so forth. Well, again, that's easier said than done. Cornell Theory Center, which we also were funding at the time, uh, cited obstacles, technical, organizational, cultural, and they said, in, in that red thing, they said, while computers can scale, people do not. Now, I didn't understand what they were talking about at the time, and I still don't understand what they're talking about. Does anyone understand that? <laughs> anyway, we didn't try to do it, so. <laughs> So uh, there we had done our traveling and listening, and we started three meetings, the, the super hardware manufacturers with the supercomputer people, ultimately telecom, although we did that la later, and the software people. So let me tell you about that. So here in November 93 at NLM, as it happened, room that doesn't even exist anymore, we had uh, the CEO and the chief science officer of the 12, or however many there are there, 13, 14, I guess, by now. We had everybody who built supercomputers in the world with the exception of Fuji. We had all American manufacturers in that room, CEO and chief science officers. And we were essentially asking them, what can we do to help? Well, huh, the conclusions were, from every single one of them, I mean, everyone had its ample time to do the talk, uh, our supercomputer designs are wonderful, and the fabrication is coming along very well. Splendid progress, great fun. Any problems? Well, software is either awful or absent. Pretty interesting. I mean, that is honest to God what every single company said in that meeting. And, and help from HPCC would be welcome. So they weren't saying, government, keep your hands off. They're saying, look, you want to know a problem? There's the problem. If you can do something about it, do it. So we thought, well, what we better do is have a meeting with the software people. Hardware guys are okay, look at the software. So we, and it was like night and day, we made a list of 150 people who vend software to computers, potentially to supercomputers. And uh, this list is fairly, includes some fairly big companies, but 
you know, ones like Thinking Machine is not in the software business, for heaven's sake, but they're going to show up, just, you know, don't want to be blindsided. Uh, and the last is many, many, many small companies. So the way the thing worked with the supercomputer manufacturers, we called them, we asked if they, you know, would, would like to come to the meeting, would it be agreeable, they tell us what we need and so forth, and they said, yeah, sure, let's do it. When do you want to do it? And essentially they said, you just name the, name the day and the time and we'll, you know, fire up the corporate jet, we'll be there, you know, on time. And we got to leave by, it's kind of noisy machine, so we got to leave Washington National by 10.30. Other than that, whatever you want to do is fine. Well, when we wrote to these software guys, what they said was, will you guys pay travel? <laughs> I kid you not, I mean, it was like night and day. Anyway, we had our meeting, uh, and the bottom line is this is what they concluded. With the machines now extant, there is not enough money in software, so the independent software vendors are not willing or able to port codes into the multi-parallel uh, processing architectures. Can't help. Isn't that interesting? Very different. And of course, the public is even less interested in supercomputer software. I mean, no appeal to them. That's ridiculous. So what I did is look down at the, th these are the federal agencies that were part of the program. And NOAA, you might find slightly surprising as my focus, but uh, as it happened, uh, Hurricane Andrew had just come whipping out of the Carib toward Florida. And this little point here is where it struck Florida. But, and, and so the NOAA computer projection, you know, the weather system people, had predicted where it would hit, but not exactly precisely. They said, could be 30 miles this way, could be 30 miles that way. So, you know, it's like 60 miles of coast, but basically they got the prediction correct. And uh, why do you care how precise? Well, I mean, if you're on the receiving end of it, you care quite a lot, because you wish that there were more people to help both, you know, with the wreckage and also with the medical sort, and uh, it'd make a big difference if you're a little bit better. So it turned out in this particular case, there was a supercomputer uh, center at Princeton running similar codes, and they predicted it more precisely, but two days late. So that, that machine quit running two days after the hurricane hit, but it could predict it plus or minus 10 miles. So that's a big, big difference if you're going to deploy rescue people and health people and all the rest of it, and also not get booted out of your house. That's not so pleasant either. So I found that this was the most, most understandable to a general audience, what was supercomputing all about. So thank you, lady. Now about the same time, Boeing, we'd been working with them, but not on this particular project, but they, they completed the design of the 777, which, believe me, is a super aircraft, the best in the skies ever. And their, their goal there was that there would never, ever be uh, a drawing. There were no blueprints of a 777 any way, shape, or form. It is all totally computerized. So again, controllable and quality control and all that kind of stuff. Tremendous accomplishment. Now, this issue about software, uh, I'm here to tell you, is still a problem. I mean, I don't know if you have people talk about this or not, but the current Boeing aircraft, the Dreamliner, 64% of the cost is information systems. 64% is not aluminum and all this other stuff. That it is, or, or engines, it is information systems. So this is like $6 billion out of nine. It's a lot of money. And of that 64%, 70% of it is reprogramming. You got it wrong the first time, redo it. Well, it's a hell of a thing to redo it on that kind of a scale. And the Air Force has got a program going now that essentially would create models of the, of the programming task. So their claim is that if you'll give us 250,000 bucks a year, we'll save you yet more on the first plane you deliver. Uh, yet to be found out, but it, it leaves aside the military because there, you know, if you're going to go into one of these fly-offs, you never will sell the first plane. So the, the software problem is still 
definitely unsolved. I mean, it is, I, I would say, not even understood. A guy named Bob Floyd used to chair computer science at Stanford when I was on an advisory committee. His field was uh, theory of computability, which would mean, in theory, that you could run a program through those kind of pro tests, you know, and it would say whether it was correct. Well, you can't do it. So either at a dreamliner level or at a balance your checkbook level, still can't prove any of these damn programs will work or do what they're supposed to do. Well, anyway, our technical goals were still what I said, gigabit transmission, petaflop computation, and it, oops, and it left uh, the communications part. I mean, it really it was originally high-performance computing. We actually had to kind of negotiate with uh, the White House to let us add communications because it was perfectly obvious communications at least as important as the computer speed. So this was achieved by these gigabit test beds, which were set up. The slide is from uh, Corporation for National Research Initiatives, but it's really Bob Kahn. So he, he took... It was between five and seven million dollars, wasn't a huge amount of money, from NSF. He was really operating more or less like a division of NSF. And he organized phone companies uh, to, to, to set up these, these routes, Casa, Magic, Blanca, Aurora, so forth, uh, just to show that, yes, you could do it. Well, this is between operators. So, for instance, I remember going to this, this one here that was between General Tell and Bell. Now, those are not friendly folks to begin with, and everything is proprietary. So, so Bob was spending five, five to seven million dollars, but he said in his report that the companies were putting in 10 times that amount of money to go into the experiment, to actually send a signal at a, a gigabit speed from coast to coast. And make a long story short, largely because of his work, it was achieved within two years Actually, I think when the report was written, we we're sending it 750 million bits per second. So the, the newspapers called it a government gigabit, a gigabit after taxes. <laughs> <laughs> but it pretty soon picked up speed. So what lessons I learned from that is that the really fine individual scientists and scholars and all those agencies there is a very high overhead in interagency projects just because they have different scales and starting times and management schemes, but, but it's all worthwhile if a really big expenditures are necessary. Essentially, we're trying to round up $2 billion a year for internet, and of course, got it and it worked. It has to be admitted there's a certain clumsiness in federal government, not fatal, and there is a proper relationship, I believe, between industry and the university. I mean, being a university guy to begin with, I, was, I always felt that knew good people in the agencies and there must be a smooth way to work with them. So I still think that's true. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the NLM side because the internet changed NLM substantially. Uh, free, free Medline. No, let's try the one you picked out. <laughs> Okay. Actually, I've tried that one, though. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you about it later. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Um, I'm sure that uh, many of you out there have read the notices uh, when the season rolls around the flu season that you should be going ahead and getting a flu, flu shot shots. Flu or shots. having your parents get a flu shot, and you kind of go back and forth, gee, should I really bother? Should I encourage my parents to do that? So let's look at... Um, uh-oh. Boy, look at what he's trying to do. Wow. Should I get a flu shot? That's not going to work. <laughs> The term should was not found. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Look, we got a good query right here. Where? Ro the, uh, vaccination vaccination against, in against influenza and elderly persons. Okay, pretty close. Let's try that one. No, let's see related articles. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun, and uh, Mr. Gore was very, very good supporter. I dare say that this development by itself may do more to reform and improve the quality of health care in the United States than anything else we've done in a long time. True. Good for him. So internet changed things for us. 
Essentially, it said, all right, now you can do stuff like full text of biomedical articles. You can eliminate the, a bunch of charges we used to make. We store and retrieve big files. But now you have an obligation to do that, to serve patients, families, and the public directly. Get out of the business of just doctors and scientists. Get in the business of the public. So for example, how did we get Medline Plus is a big success. How did we ever get there? Well, because of what I said, we eliminated the, the, the major charges for Medline searches. We're spending a order of magnitude $14 million, and $13 million of it was to the network people. So by hopping on an internet, we eliminated all that. The other million left over was paying somebody else to charge people for searches. So what happened was a sudden huge increase in use of this Medline system, Medline Plus system. Uh, and there we could see that there were a lot of doctors on it, but there were a lot of others in the Medline systems. And those were basically patients, families, and the public, and we decided we better do something to serve them better, and that's how Medline Plus came along. The other part of it was outreach, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about that because uh, after a quite a bit of outreaching, that is to say trips going to underserved populations, which in our case is Native American societies for the most part, we concluded that we had a lot to learn about, from them about healthcare and that we also had a lot to learn about the limitations, the power of information per se. So here's a good guy, Tex Hall. We're a treaty tribe, we're 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty Tribe and uh, the government said, uh, if you make peace with us and sign with your name or with your ex, uh, Mandan forebears, Hidatsa forebears, and Sunastar from the Arikara, they all signed the, uh, the treaty with their ex, and the government said as long as the grass grows and the river wind blows run. and the river flows, you know, yep. we'll, we'll keep this treaty and honor it in perpetuity. And we all know the, the history that they never did. Smallpox was a... Um, and there actually was a government policy that uh, to inoculate uh, the Indian tribes up on the Missouri because that's where the, a lot of the steamships, you know, mm -hmm. were, were coming up to uh, Fort Beaufort and then Fort Clark, uh, where the Mandan Fort Clark and the Honest Land. But Fort Clark is where the, the steamship Yellowstone actually killed one of our greatest chiefs, uh, Mato Dopish forebears. And his quote is a... Is a, is a very powerful quote of uh, how he said he trusted the white man, but he said, "Look what look what happened to me." And he told his told his people, "Never trust a white man again because because uh, of this." Uh. What our native youth need is role models. Sure. Um, and the very basic idea of having a Native American person from the community go back to that community and say, "I'm a Native American medical student," or yeah. "I'm a Native American physician." Yeah. And by my pure, by my pure example of just being who I am yeah. and actually displaying that yeah. for the kids, yeah. does wonders. We found out in the middle of all this. I found out that most Indians don't live in reservations. They live in. There are American Indians. There are Lakota, cities. Shoshone, Navajo, Arapaho, Potawatomi living in the cities. But I don't know, we do not refer to each other as urban Indians. I have yet to walk up to another Native American and ask him, where are you from? And he says, well, I'm an urban Indian. No. When they answer that, it's hard to establish a relationship or a relative. Yeah. I've had that experience in New York City and also here recently in Seattle, just this morning, walking down the street. Uh, 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 Ogallala from Pine Ridge really? came up and started to talk with me. No and kidding. We shared some of our uh, common friends and relatives. And yeah. uh, so it's, it's about your, your relatives. I, I said to him, I bet you he hit you up for a fiver. And he said, yeah, he did. <laughs> Here's an interesting guy. When my dad was an architect in New York. And so I grew up knowing that Mohawk Indians do the high steel work. I mean, that's just the way it is. In the city, are they well treated? It depends where they go and what they're involved in. Yeah. I know uh, uh, when I first went to Manhattan, when I was 20, I went to the Union Hall and I was very well treated huh. uh, because there's uh, something of a reputation. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the first job uh, uh, I got in Manhattan, 
was on Tower A of the World Trade Center. Wow. And uh, uh, I was 20 and never been uh, that much up in the air. And uh, I thought, well, the, my partner is going to know what he's doing. I'll follow him, and I'm a quick study. I get on the job floor, everybody meets each other, and they say, this is your partner. First thing he said, oh, good, an Indian. Said, I know you know what you're doing. I'm going to follow you. That's a, a thing missing on, in, on many reservations, isn't it? Uh, definitely missing. He left Mohawk and went out uh, west where his wife lived. The culture of a work uh, uh, background is missing. Yeah. It's the this lady. I was a IHS scholarship recipient for my school when I went through school, um, college and medical school. And so I think I'm actually the first IHS director who was an IHS scholarship recipient. That's wonderful. Yes, yeah, so in, the program in works. Services. Yeah, this is a, a fabulous guy. This is a witch doctor, I guess you'd say, Indian healer. They come in through the door. 70% of the problem is already taken care of. It no longer exists. 10% I do, 20% they do. They generally start on when it happened, how it happened, how it began, and how it started. They'll tell you all that, okay? They also tell you what you got to do for them in order to help them. So what we do is we learn to do and evaluate in a sense, when we're talking to them and then try to bring them up to another level of where we deal with them, where we have to deal with them. That seems to you me, know, because like I said, you really don't have to be an expert on anything. You just have to learn how to listen, and he'll tell you, like I said. This guy is a, knows patients. Here's one in Hawaii. Now, what we learned here is that uh, I would say you have to have some pride in yourself and your tribe and your people or you're not going to value health. When I was born, when I was raised, to be Hawaiian meant to be second rate. These kids, when they're born, they don't feel that or sense mm. that. Their foundation they grow from is different. And that, and that, That's great. But, you know, the economic, the social, the health, the... Those issues, those statistical issues, which are lagging issues, um, um, haven't necessarily really changed. But the genesis of the child being born in Hawaii, but the difference between being depressed or proud is shifted. Yeah, and I know a Thompson is his name, but in back of him was this wonderful uh, double sailing canoe. Uh, we have a model of it in, the, in our lobby in this show, Native Voices. And I've actually gone sailing on it. They're 70, 68 feet long. Wonderful machine. And I didn't understand for the first year or so what they're talking about, what it meant. But what it meant to them is to acknowledge that their people came from, you know, 2,500 ocean miles away and found their way to those islands. So be proud. I mean, that's, that's what it really means. Whereas if you spend all your life being told you're a ignorant, ugly, ignorant, you know, worthless native, why would you worry about a little extra avoir de poids or the risk of diabetes? I mean, who cares? You're worthless anyway. I mean, you have to get beyond that before anyone can talk health. When I was born... I'm going to go ahead. When we have a son that went to Afghanistan, and he spent he a Navajo some code time... Talker. Talker. Uh, over there, way up in the four operation base, that's where he was. And he had a serious, mm. I don't know what they did to him over there, but when he came home, he, he's not the same son that we had. Oh. We tried to entice him to have the ceremony, but well, he said, I'll wait, see what happens, you know, and make excuses mm. and so on. So, so it does affect people. I didn't realize. No. This old guy was 0900 in Iwo Jima. And uh, he sent three sons into the Army. This last one he's talking about was a bird colonel who came back. How does a person PTSD. know? 
to have a traditional healing practices or Western? They are diagnostician, hand trembler. Wow. Uh, they, uh, there's one of the ceremony the VA pays for. Uh, they, uh, you know, they do hand tremblings, and they find out what it is. They also start gauging. They look in the crystal and things uh, like that. Uh, and how does the hand trembling thing work? I don't know. It's a yeah. socket. Oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not one of them, so I, yeah. but my grandmother did. Yeah. There's a lot of other people that I know. Uh -huh. They go like this and then they put, uh, you know, corn powder and then they're seeking information for this individual to mm. see what is really wrong with yeah. the individual. So he's coming pretty close to saying maybe baloney. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about at least what I see is uh, the limitations in the power of information. You're all taught information is power. Well, it is, but it sure has its limits. This is a... The ability to access an nutritious food and the high cost of living is a huge barrier to health mm -hmm. in the villages. Lovely gal and in we're Alaska. seeing that in obesity. We're seeing that in diabetes. And, and all of those rates are increasing yeah. in the rural areas. So, are they? So, are there any bad attitudes? Or um, bad mental models, let's say? Oh, you know, I think, I think we still see that a lot today. Like, you know, feeling like they don't have control over issues in their community. They don't have control over what's happening to them economically, financially. Um, they don't have control over what they can get in the grocery store in rural communities. Why is that? Because of transportation issues. It's, no, very, it's just not there. It's just not yeah, there. Yeah, you, yeah. If you go into um, a grocery store in St. Paul or St. George, it's very hard to eat in a healthy manner. You don't have fresh vegetables and fruits, or if you do, they're three weeks old. <laughs> they're mm. pretty rough looking. Yeah. Um, in a lot of cases, getting water is more expensive than getting pop. Terrible. She works for a very good outfit, Indian Health, uh, Native uh, Alaskan Health Center, and uh, they do a good job, very good job. We also have a wellness center. I think I'll Nutrition. Go. And nutrition, unfortunately, like so many other Pacific Hawaiian Islands, physician. has taken on the convenience of fast foods, the, the change and the, the taste uh, elements of certain foods. That's why, unfortunately, Hawaii is the best market for Minnesota-based firm called Spam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a common everyday item in so many people, but they don't realize that it's high caloric, high sodium, and the people have not been trained correctly in really what is the most effective day-to-day uh, -day diet that they can uh, utilize. This guy was the first physician to go out on the first sailing of that, uh, that boat. I later. got sued by Hormel way back when we were talking about our diet because it called Spam, Uncle Spam. Uh -huh. Because that's been, you know, the can that's gone across the Pacific and into all the Indian nations. Oh, yeah. Cheap, easy, yeah. preserved, high nitrate foods that uh, are affordable. I think I'll go by. Now, here's pictures of delivering information, in this case in Uganda. So we're sort of against malaria, if you will, out there. And uh, the, the gal in the upper right is a sort of a one-person army to bring help to Africa. But uh, here's what she encountered. Uh, so so the inf what, what information would you want to know? Well, the, the most simple thing is that malaria is caused by the bite of Anopheles mosquitoes. It gives you this little infection. But I'll tell you, they don't, you, they cannot be, persuaded that that's true because they already know that a person gets malaria by eating ripe mangoes. So what to do? Well, this, the, my one, one gal army, 
has made this kind of thing to teach them. Oba dochimanyi nti omusujja gwensiri tegulete wa kulya miyembe. So you got to tell them in their language you got to use pictures you got to say it again and again of course she, there is a good medical school of course in Uganda so she works with them and the the uh, men and women there uh, do go to the villages but I'm just saying if, if you know in your heart that you get malaria by eating white mangoes then when somebody says hang up these sheets that keep mosquitoes off you when you're sleeping I mean it doesn't make any sense and I was looking around I didn't bring you a picture of what those mosquito things look like after a year or so they hang them at the windows for curtains they use them for wedding gowns I mean they're ripped to pieces totally ridiculous so the limitations well self without self-respect there isn't any health seeking good diets in Alaska are pretty damn hard to get spam we've already set upon the poor Hawaiians I'm going to show you about athletics in the Arctic uh, and I'll just say, without any further preachment, that recruitment of Native Americans to medicine health careers is going terribly, badly, worse now than 10 years ago, in spite of a lot of trying. So what to do, where to go? Well, this is a place called Hope, Alaska. You'll have to have a good gazetteer to find it at all, but it's a nice little place. Occasionally, go, go back there, you can feel better. But here's the library. And look, we've arrived at a sale day. And luckily, right next door is <laughs> the coffee shop, Grounds for Hope. And, and that's a category of thing I'm going to describe very briefly. I'll show you some Grounds for Hope. There's a certain level of accountability when you're with your community. Yeah. I'm accountable to Marty. Um, I'm accountable to my aunties. I'm accountable to my elders and my community. Yeah. And if they see me doing something that is hurtful to myself or others, that I can be called on that. Yeah. Um, when you're part of a Native community, there's, you play a part. There's a role for you. And, you know, people are there to, to tell you um, that you have to answer to them. And, and I think it's expected when we're very dispersed and, and we're not engaging each other. You're able to do things without someone telling you, and you may not know that you're making a bad choice. But when you've got people who hold you to a higher standard and they tell you something, you have respect for them, and you want to make sure that you, you heed their words and, and you follow in their footsteps and, and um, that you don't disappoint them. That object there is a newborn baby, not hers but her sister's that she just took on when the sister got wiped out in an automobile accident. I have a low, low thyroid level. And I found it in a medical book because they didn't have all the com some computer thing. And I l looked up what was happening, like crying without any reason. Mm -hmm. And oh. uh, so I went to my doctor and I said, I would like a protein-bound iodine test. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, it was in the medical book. And so, Good for you. So I asked, you know, the doctor and he gave it to me and found out, you know, that that was causing the weight gain because I'd been normal. Yeah, so normal these are up to that old ladies point. in an old ladies home in Seattle, Native Americans, and this gal walks up to her doctor and says, oh, please order a PBI for me, <laughs> which turned out to be exactly the right thing. So in, again, an Alaska picture, this is a village, of course, but if you want to be athletic, uh, there's no point talking about stuff like baseball and football because the weather doesn't permit it. But basketball, they do. So here is the champion girls basketball team of this village. And this is a guy from NLM, David Nash, who is a former globetrotter. And uh, they, they get along very, very well. I want to end up with two things that remind us that there's a little science left too in the world. This is a thing that pleased me. Uh, Alan Cormack gave it to me. I got him to give the first outside lecture at AMIA. But uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 63 for the science behind the CAT scan. And, but he says here, uh, you ha don't have to read it word for word, but essentially he's saying that when he got interested in this physics field, he, uh, he assumed that just homogeneous slabs of material and x-rays going through them, so-called phantom, uh, that's what they used to standardize x-rays in a, a physician x-ray lab. But he said he assumed that the, dis, the inhomogeneous model must surely have been worked out. 
you know, as if you were, you're not homogeneous, of course, you got lungs and heart and all that. But he couldn't find it. He looked in the literature and the math thing and he asked everybody and he couldn't find a damn thing about that ever having been done. And uh, so he thought, well, uh, I guess I got to do it myself. So he, he started writing things down and uh, essentially to him that's the intuitively obvious equation. <laughs> and essentially it says that if a, if a beam is going through this object, now call it a body if you will, and it'll be, it'll be slowed up a little better, it'll be, there'll be absorption by the things in the body, uh, so it won't be quite as strong when it comes out on the other side. Now if you imagine that, which is what the CAT scan does, if you imagine that instead of one beam, you've got beams going from every direction imaginable surrounding that person, and then you sum, you sum the absorption in all of those beams, that will be the body, the person that you make an image of. So, uh, again, he assumed someone had done this, and he waited 14 years. Now, this is where you gotta be, uh, I guess, give a little credit, not just to NLM, but to the whole biomedical profession, because we have someplace to look. These guys don't. They really honestly don't. So, it took 14 years for him to find out that a guy named Radon had, in fact, solved, mathematically, the exact same problem except that he was solving it for the planets and stars. So it was the obverse of, the pla of, the, of that problem, but the same mathematics. So we're lucky. Another lucky is people finally, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, finally in 2005 getting a Nobel Prize for discovering that all this utter nonsense about stress causing ulcers and all this you know, psychiatric malarkey was nonsense, it was a bacterium. And uh, they said when they accepted the prize that the information he obtained from the National Library of Medicine a aided his discovery. In fact, it made it possible because he was out thousands of miles from anywhere, and really the outback of Australia, a thousand miles from in Port Hedland. So we kept peppering him with whatever it is he wanted, and what, the, what he wanted was articles that showed that inflammation was associated with this ailment. So, returning to Alaska, I returned to a nice campfire, and I think that some of the times libraries are still powerful enough to aid Nobel Prize winners, and when we're not, we're at least trying. So, thank you for your attention. And thank you for leaving us on that beach. Uh, what a good place to end. That was an amazing talk. I thank you, and uh, once again, my congratulations uh, for the award. I think we are running a bit late, um, but uh, let me just uh, wish you safe travels, and uh, thank you for joining us here. I hope to see you in December or other places in between. Thanks again.